Okay, so could you tell us about your field of expertise, please? Okay, so I'm uh, a psycholinguist and an educational linguist, and I look at um, reading acquisition in children, and specifically I look at the acquisition of reading uh, in Arabic among Arabic native-speaking kids. Specifically, the impact of diglossia on reading acquisition, meaning the impact of the fact that children develop uh, or acquire naturally the spoken variety of the language. Uh, we usually refer to this as spoken Arabic or colloquial Arabic. And then when they go to school, they are required to learn to read and write in standard Arabic, which is uh, a uniform variety across the Arabic speaking world. And uh, it's remarkably different from the spoken vernacular. So I look at the impact of this linguistic distance on the acquisition of reading in children. Okay, great. So can you tell us a little bit, um, especially for people who don't necessarily know Arabic, about the language and the writing system and how that works for literacy? Okay, so the language is a Semitic language. Um, the writing system is called an abjad, which is a special type of alphabet. So basically we're talking about an orthography, which consists of basically um, two orthographic systems. One is letters, so we have letters that basically map the consonants of the language and the long vowels. And we have diacritics, which map basically the short vowels of the language, plus consonant gemination and null vowelization. Uh, as well as a set of diacritics, which maps a case on, onto nouns and, and adjectives and mood onto verbs. Now, the interesting thing is that these inflectional, these diacritics, which are um, inflections, have disappeared from all of the spoken dialects. So we're talking about uh, an orthographic system, yes, which is linguistically absent mm -hmm. from spoken Arabic. Mm -hmm. Yes, but this is something that is encoded uh, in the written word, and it's something that conventionally children are taught to decode when they come to learn to read in the first grade. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they need to learn the letters of the language, and they also need to learn the diacritics, both the diacritics which they need in order to identify the word, meaning to understand it, and also the diacritics which encode case and mood, yes, which are important for accuracy, Mm -hmm. Yes, for reading aloud, for accuracy, but they are very rarely needed for comprehension. Right. And then can you tell us something about the context, maybe including a little bit more about the diglossia situation, but the, the context in which children are learning to read Arabic? Okay, um, I can, I can uh, uh, describe the situation um, in Israel which is where I come from, which is where I conduct my research. So it's among speakers of Palestinian Arabic who reside in Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, children start formal schooling at the age of approximately five, six, um, in kindergarten. That's one year before grade one. So I'd say five is kindergarten, grade one is six. Literacy instruction usually starts in the first grade, not in kindergarten. Even though in kindergarten there are, you know, uh, uh, there is a great deal of storybook reading to expose children to the written language, mainly orally, but there is not as much literacy instruction, teaching of the letters, teaching of phonemic awareness. This usually happens in the first grade. And the, 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 Remarkable challenge is that in the first grade, these kids are required to learn the orthography, yes, to acquire the orthography, and also to, to acquire the language, the standard Arabic language. So basically, they are acquiring two systems, the, the standard language, which is encoded in print, as well as the orthography, which encodes this, uh, this language. And this is a remarkable challenge, especially when in my research, I show that if we look at the lexicon of five-year-olds, we find that the lexicon of five-year-olds consists of very many words, yes, mm -hmm. which are not used in standard Arabic. So 40% of the words in, in one study that I conducted in the center of Israel, 
I found that the lexicon of five-year-olds consists of three types of words, yes? So one portion of this lexicon, 40% of it, are words which these kids are not going to see in print because these are unique spoken Arabic words which don't have any conventional written form. They are not used in writing Arabic. So this is 40%. Another 40% are cognates, which I call cognates. And these are words which are used in standard Arabic, but they have different surface phonological form in the two varieties. So this would be a word like dhahab uh, for, go for gold, which would be dhahab in standard Arabic and dhahab in my dialect. Yes? And of course, the, the phonological distance can vary from one phonological parameter to, to eight phonological parameters. So that's another 40% of the lexicon of five-year-olds. And 20% of the lexicon are the identical words. So these are the words which these kids are going to encounter in books. Yes, only 20% of the words in the lexicon of five-year-olds maintain the same phonological form in standard Arabic. But I should say here that this is a simplification of the, of the real situation because these 20%, yes, these words, which I call identical, when they are used in standard Arabic, they are going to receive those inflections for case and mood. Yes, so they will eventually be phonologically different from the four views in spoken Arabic with all of these inflections added at the end of words. But nonetheless, when we look at these lexemes, when we only look at the lexeme, the word, we find that 20% of the words maintain an identical form, what I call an identical form. Now, when we think about the orality literacy gap, this is a huge gap. Yes, this is a huge gap, which, of course, has very important implications for the acquisition of literacy. Yes. Just as a follow-up, so do they also, um, the children that you work with, have to learn Hebrew at some point? Or yes, not? And yes. when does that happen? <clears throat> okay, in Israel, Arabic-speaking kids, according to the Minister of Education, are taught Hebrew in the third grade as a second language. Mm -hmm. yeah? So Arabic-speaking kids, yes, speakers of Palestinian Arabic in Israel, are Arabic monolinguals. Mm -hmm. Yes, when they start uh, 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 the reading acquisition, they are monolinguals in the sense that they speak mainly uh, uh, Arabic, and many of them are not exposed to, to Hebrew because they come from either villages or little towns. And even when they, when they live in, in cities, uh, uh, research shows that even when Arabs live, live in mixed cities, they live in isolated uh, 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 places. So Arabic-speaking kids then start out as Arabic monolinguals. In grade three, they, are, they start learning uh, Hebrew as as an, an additional language, but mainly I would characterize it as a foreign language for many of the kids. In grade four, they start English as another foreign language. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, of course, for kids who, who, who happen to live in Tel Aviv and who are surrounded by Hebrew speaking, uh, um, Hebrew native speakers might be learning this language as a second language, but in general, it's two foreign languages that they have to uh, uh, to learn together with uh, together with Arabic oh, in elementary school. In elementary school, yes. Right. And those are three different scripts, or would you say Hebrew and Arabic are related? Yes, I mean, yes, yes. Scripts. Three different scripts. Yeah. Uh, the Semitic, the the Hebrew, Hebrew and Arabic as two Semitic languages are very similar in structure. They are very similar in morphology, for instance. Both are root-based languages. In both languages, we have uh, consonantal roots, which uh, basically uh, um, uh, represent the meaning family of the word. And there are word patterns, which give us the categorical and phonological form of the word. In both languages, we find that kids develop morphological awareness very early on because morphology is so much uh, um, predominant in both Hebrew and in Arabic. So uh, I show in my research, for instance, that very young kids in grade one already use morphological processing for spelling. We find that morphological processing is predictive of reading and spelling in Arabic, and we have similar uh, also results uh, from Hebrew. So linguistically, the two languages are, are similar, but orthographically, yes, we're talking about three different alphabets. Yeah. Yes, three different scripts. Great. Um, do you want to say any more about what it takes for children to learn to read in Arabic? Um, my main interest, as I said, is the impact of diglossia on, on learning to read. But uh, of course, there are other uh, um, uh, interesting aspects of learning to read in, in, in uh, Arabic. Uh, and one very important aspect is um, vowelization, what's called vowelization, or the use of diacritics 
to represent uh, basically short vowels and uh, the case and, uh, and mood markers. I think vowelization is very important uh, for the fact that usually in research and also among uh, uh, lay people, when we talk about vowelization, when we talk about diacritics, we treat diacritics as one monolithic system. Yeah? When we talk about Arabic, we can't talk about diacritics as one system. There are two systems of diacritics, unlike Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Yes, in Hebrew, we can refer to one system of diacritics. Mm -hmm. In Arabic, we have to distinguish between two systems of diacritics, which I call in, in my chapter with Ronnie Henke in 2014, phonemic diacritics and morphosyntactic diacritics. The phonemic diacritics are those diacritics which kids need in order to identify the word. So if we talk about like uh, three-letter words, like the very important example, which is usually cited in research, kataba. Yes, so it could be kataba, it could be kutiba, it could be kutub. Okay, it's a homographic, uh, uh, it's a homographic form. Now these diacritics, yes, are important for lexical access. You need to know if this is kataba or kutub or kutiba. But we have to distinguish this system from the second system, which I call the morphosyntactic diacritics, which appear at the ends of words. Yes, usually at the ends of words, but they can also be uh, uh, one letter before the end of the word if we have clitics added onto the word. Now, these are important, or what I think, uh, or the reason why I think it's important to distinguish between the two systems is because this second system, this latter system, is not a system that is needed for word identification. But it's a system that, has been conventionally uh, uh, considered important for reading accuracy. So when you test reading accuracy in Arabic, yes, and you give kids a list of words, or you give them a paragraph to read, usually you would present them with the fully vowelized form of the word. And this includes both the phonemic and the morphosyntactic. But what we find is that, okay, first of all, before we look at what kids do, we know that the phonemic diacritics are things that they need to understand. But those morphosyntactic are not. Yes, we all, as, as, as adults, as skilled readers, we all read the default orthography, which is unvowelized, and we all understand what we're reading without these diacritics, the phonemic and the morphosyntactic. Yes? But the thing is, when we, when we look at diacritics, we treat both as being the same, but we know that these are two systems, they have two different functions, they have two different distribution in the language, and they have, a diff they have different relationships with reading development. Yes? So, uh, uh, and that's why, for instance, when we look at reading accuracy and comprehension, if we, if we take accuracy of the fully vowelized word, we find that, that it doesn't correlate with reading comprehension. Yes? Or we find that, for instance, when you give the word, the, uh, when you ask kids to read the unvowelized form, it's significantly more difficult for him than the, than the vowelized. Yes? But when the two are confused, we don't know why this is so. Is it because of the phonemic uh, diacritics? Or is it because of the morphosyntactic, which basically native speakers do not master? Yes, and these kids at school are only taught about these, these diacritics. Mm -hmm. So what I try to do in my research is to look at these two systems separately, mm -hmm. to try and understand the contribution of these two systems separately. Yes, mm -hmm. and I think this, this is very important to also uh, uh, start to adopt in thinking about relationship between accuracy and reading comprehension in different languages and different scripts. And also, how do we define, how do we define accuracy? Yes. Do we define accuracy only in terms of uh, being able to recode the word as it's represented in the orthography accurately? Or are we talking about accuracy as another way of looking at, at uh, lexical access, as word, uh, at word identification? In English, when we say word reading accuracy correlates with reading comprehension, yes, we basically imply that word reading accuracy, meaning word recognition, word identification, correlates with, with comprehension. But when you do accuracy in Arabic, you're looking at something different. Mm -hmm. Yes, our definition of accuracy has also to become less Anglo-centric, yes. yes, and take into account the characteristics of the language and, and of the orthography. Right. Yes. So, um, this covers a lot of the questions. Um, is there anything else you um, could tell us about the extent to which there are elements of reading and writing that are not covered? in the Anglo-centric uh, view of reading? Mm. That's a very important one. I mean, that's huge. Anything else um, to say about that? Uh, 
Well, the the issue of the linguistic distance, which uh, uh, which I look at when when we when I study reading development, is very important. But I would like just to again emphasize that when we talk about linguistic distance, we also may be, may be talking about two different things. Uh, so linguistic distance, when we think about, for instance, uh, uh, speakers of African American vernacular English, yes, learning to read in standard in standard English, and we think about linguistic distance. Yes, so we think about the, the form of the word as it's stored in the memory of speakers of African American uh, English, as opposed to the form that is encoded in print, yes, in, in, the, in uh, written English. So this is one very important aspect of linguistic distance, which is also true for Arabic, because as I said, there is a, um, a huge lexical and lexicophonological distance between words in spoken Arabic and their form in standard Arabic. So this is one very important aspect. But in Arabic, there is another aspect, yes? And that's, again, the, the morphosyntactic diacritics, which, which I uh, uh, talked about. So this is another aspect of linguistic distance, which uh, basically refers to phonological information, linguistic information, which is absent from the language that, that you speak and which you need to learn together with learning to read uh, in the language. So I think uh, conceptually, it's very important that we distinguish also between these two aspects of, of uh, linguistic distance when we try to, again, refine our understanding of the impact of linguistic distance and orthographic depth on uh, learning to read in different languages and different orthographies. Great. Um, I, I hope it's okay. I'd like to just ask you one question about, a little bit more about context, because um, Arabic speakers in, in Israel, um, other people around the world. I mean, so many of the models focus on like kind of uh, middle income monolingual English speakers. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else like contextually or in terms of um, socioeconomic aspects or cultural aspects that um, you, you could say something about in terms of literacy development in ter compared to like the standard whatever, not standard but the American model. Maybe. Okay, well, um, <clears throat> one thing that I would like to say is that uh, we have looked at the impact of socioeconomic status on literacy acquisition. We do find, like other studies have found for other languages, that socioeconomic status contributes unique variants to our understanding of the acquisition of literacy. So those kids who come from high uh, SES or mid-high SES uh, basically develop better. Yes, and, and come to school with better foundational, uh, foundational skills. But there is one very important distinction between the impact or the, the um, context surrounding high versus low SES in Arabic and in diglossia in general, as opposed to standard with dialect contexts. So when we think about standard with dialect contexts, like the, the standard, the, like the African American vernacular English, uh, then we think about um, uh, speakers who come from high SES, yes, uh, mainly being exposed by their parents to standard English at home. One very good friend of mine uh, said, my, my mother uh, didn't speak uh, African American vernacular English with me, with us. She, she spoke standard English so that we, we are prepared mm -hmm. uh, to reading in standard English when we go to school. Now, this thing doesn't happen in Arabic. Because in a diglossic context, no one would speak the standard language at home. Yes, this is not the language variety that is used in informal settings. Mm -hmm. So friends of mine would say, okay, uh, I, you are a professor, your husband is a dentist, why don't you speak standard Arabic with your kids so that you make uh, you know, reading acquisition easier for them? I would say no one would do it. Yes, no professor, no layman, no one would do it. No one speaks standard Arabic at home. Mm -hmm. Standard Arabic is not the language for informal speech. Mm -hmm. Yes, and this is a very important difference between diglossic context and standard with uh, standard with uh, uh, with uh, dialect uh, context, and it's it's a difference that has very important implications for uh, also the psychological pressure to acquire standard Arabic, the competition between a standard and spoken as to spoken languages, which is something that we see in in standard with dialect context, but not in a diglossic context. Mm -hmm. So these fine-grained differences are important because they, they, they also define the, the linguistic context, yes? And of course, when we better understand those uh, um, very subtle 
differences in the context, we better understand differences in the trajectory of, of language and reading development in different contexts. Um, okay, so I'm down to the last question. Any other important issues or topics that you think would be of interest to a broad MOOC group, teachers, um, people who teach early literacy around the world? Um, well, the, the, the topic of dyslexia in Arabic, yes, which is another thing that I, that I uh, look at, uh, what predicts dyslexia, what is the manifestation of dyslexia in Arabic, and also uh, SLI, yes, uh, I'm starting to look also at the linguistic manifestation of SLI in Arabic. How do we, well, first of all, uh, how does SLI manifest itself? How does it show up in uh, speakers of, uh, of Arabic? Do we see similar deficits to SLI in, in other languages? Or do we see different deficits? Do, do we see different gains also? I mean, the, there may be also some gains in the fact that uh, morphology is very rich and therefore when you have phonological... And that's what, I, that's what I show for dyslexia, yes? So what we show for dyslexia is that uh, uh, kids have phonological deficits. They also have morphological deficits, yes? But their deficits in phonological processing is, is larger than the deficit that they have in morphological processing. So basically the signature of dyslexia in Arabic looks like the same signature of dyslexia in all other uh, uh, orthographies and, and uh, um, at least alphabetic orthographies, yes, and language. So it's a phonological deficit. And what we find is that they appear to rely more on morphological processing Yes. Well, it takes time until they can do this. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we see, for instance, in spelling, they start to develop in spelling only in the fourth grade. Yes. And that's probably because, you know, the, the, in the fourth grade, they have accumulated knowledge and lexicon, which enables them to use morphological processing in spelling. And morphological processing is very important in spelling in Arabic because of velarization spread, which makes which makes some letters uh, um, uh, uh, homographic and therefore you need to recover the phonological the word pattern in order to figure out how to write uh, uh, the word is it uh, do i write uh, or ta so i re i i hear ta yes but i have to, to write ta because that's that's the word pattern that's the morpheme so there is this this issue about you know the the, the deficits as well as the the um, the strength when we think about dyslexia and when we think about uh, when we think about uh, about sli so one thing that I would like to do is one day to be able to take two very different dialects, measure the linguistic distance between this spoken dialect and standard Arabic, and then look at uh, the acquisition of reading and dyslexia in these two different dialects. Because what I want to understand is how linguistic distance impacts reading in different uh, dialects and whether we can say that learning to read in this dialect is easier than in that dialect because the distance is not as large in this as opposed to, to that. So uh, empirically looking at different dialects and, and uh, impact on, on reading and dyslexia is something that I would like to do.